and this is session four of the four part prosper train excuse me of the six part prosper training um thank you all for your attendance and for being here with us today and um thank you dr corso uh we've introduced you so i'm just going to turn it over to you and let you go ahead and um continue with part four excellent thanks so much kim appreciate that so welcome back all it's uh four weeks in a row going and we're headed towards six as kim said this is module four we're going to start with a brief review again these are these are your references some, some of the scientific studies we're using to drive this curriculum here are learning objectives uh, we are heading into three and four today and then we'll cover five and six over the next two we've covered numbers one and two over the prior three webinars so just for a review remember that we have this new <clears throat> this new model we've learned about called the suicidal mode again we try not to use words like passive suicidal ideation and active suicidal ideation they're not quite as helpful as stating that someone's suicidal mode is turned on right now while they're in the clinic or maybe it was turned on earlier in the week and now it's it's off uh, yes we have predispositions yes we have triggers and these are uh, the same research we've known for 30 years uh, it's important to be aware of them but not quite to use them in either a decision making matrix or a risk assessment but rather to focus on the suicidal mode continued review we have three ways that people generally try to help suicidal persons and that's with an a sort of a cavalier approach which they tend not to ask much at all a better safe and sorry approach whereby they uh, hospitalize more easily, uh, put patients on a CRP, a crisis response plan, and we're looking to strike that collaborative approach, which is in the middle. That middle ground is one that's marked by, typically it feels like a, a risk uh, from the provider standpoint, uh, not that they're taking unnecessary risks, but rather we're not used to trusting the patient uh, in order to understand what's going on with their symptoms. And so with, with the collaborative approach really must empower the patient and trust the patient uh, for what he or she or they are experiencing. They are the experts of their own experience. And of course, once we're done assessing risk, we're not just returning to treating anxiety, depression, marital problem, job, problems, stress, finances. We're actually trying to ensure that the patient works on effective coping skills. And so that means the two main ones, emotional regulation and healthy thinking skills. Now, the emotional regulation skills in, include distress tolerance, relaxation, mindfulness. And then, of course, the healthy thinking keeps them from thinking in ways that are just either inaccurate or unhelpful. And above all else, we're going to respect patients' autonomy and ability, choice to kill themselves. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to let them leave our exam room or office or clinic and kill themselves, but we won't moralize. We won't use words like commit suicide. We'll say die by suicide, ended her life, killed himself. And we're going to make sure we avoid any power struggles. Last time we talked about situations <clears throat> in which the more questions I ask, there's this moment during risk assessment where I'm sort of asking more detailed questions and the patient gets more evasive, sort of standoffish. And to call that out right when you see it and to say, hey, it seems like the more just now I'm trying to get more detail and it's making you less comfortable or it's making you uncomfortable. Am I on to something there? Because what the patient's experiencing at that moment is a potential power struggle. So not knowing if they are going to be the driver of what happens after the appointment. Um, not knowing if someone's going to usurp their autonomy and hospitalize them. Ultimately, we have to recognize that suicide, suicidality is marked by ambivalence and, and address it head on. We'll talk about this a little later today. We did discuss this. Don't try to talk the person out of killing themselves. And what does that sound like? We talked last time that it might sound like, well, don't you think if we just did this or why don't you try this? Or most of my patients find that this, whatever that is, is helpful. And, and so it, it, please do check in with yourself and figure out what does it sound like in my words? If I think about it from my words, what does it sound like when I'm talking someone out of it? What would your children say? Do you really want your children to grow up without a father? Or, well, how would that affect your wife? What would, what would, how would 
uh, what would happen to all these responsibilities you have or your job, right? So <clears throat> these are ways of talking people out of it. And to be honest, the reason why we don't do it is because when the person's in front of us, it's actually our opportunity. If they're willing to talk about their suicidal symptoms, it's our opportunity to teach them so that they are empowered to better manage it, to squander that by talking them out of it. Maybe it puts a Band-Aid on it for just the time they're in the office, but when they go home, they haven't learned a thing. They haven't gained any skills. They're, no, they're in no different of a place than before they came into the, the clinic. So it, it's really just a, a misuse of time and, and frankly, wasting an opportunity to empower them and arm them with some skills that can actually help decrease their symptoms. Okay, here's the uh, suicide risk assessment uh, process that we've talked about, the flow chart. Again, this does mirror the uh, Columbia, the CSSRS, Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. And uh, so if you prefer that, great. If you like the flow chart, great. If you like both, fantastic. Entirely up to you. Uh, we got through skill one last week. Does anyone remember what skill one is? Let's see what, what, what people put in the chat box here. Does anyone remember what skill one is? Differentiate between two different things. Let's see if anyone gets it. All right, S I N D I. Well done, S Davis. I think uh, I think that's Sadie. Well done, Sadie. Okay, differentiate suicidal ideation from from death ideation. Absolutely, and that's because death ideation does not reliably result in suicidal uh, behaviors or attempts. Uh, death ideation may become suicidal ideation and then result in those things. Skill number two. Anyone remember skill number two? This is where we ask, well, let's see, I'll give you another 10 seconds, see if anyone chimes in. Okay, this is where we ask about a prior history of suicide attempts or suicidal behaviors. And remember that two or more uh, means they the person is considered a multiple attempter, which puts them at uh, a moderate level of risk for life. It, it's, they're chronically at a moderate level. So that's uh, according to the research. And skill number three, uh, this is assessing the current suicidal episode. So up until the first two, after the first two skills, if they answered, they don't have, let's say that the skill one, SI or DI, the person says, well, I just have thoughts of dying or wishing I wasn't here, but I don't want to kill myself. Okay. Have you ever had a prior suicide attempt? No. Have you ever engaged in suicidal behaviors? Well, Dr. Corso, what is that? Well, like planning your death, writing a suicide note, uh, rehearsing uh, the, you know, the, the suicide attempt. No, absolutely not. If the person answers no to number two and only has DI, we don't have to go any further. There is no current suicidal episode for us to assess. Okay. Then we just talk about how to handle those death thoughts. And typically we, we normalize it and say, look, it sounds like you're, you're not wanting to be here because you're overwhelmed. Well, let's figure out how to help you manage all that stuff that's overwhelming you. Whereas if the person endorses suicidal ideation and or has prior history of suicide attempts or behaviors, we're going to assess this current suicidal episode, right? So if they don't have SI, we can't assess the current episode. Only, uh, only if they have SI, not DI. Just want to make sure we're clear on that. And assessing the suicidal episode has four components. The first two were sort of contrasting. What I'd strongly encourage you to do is to ask, so when's the last time you were thinking about killing yourself? Well, okay, well, it was, uh, today's Tuesday, it was Saturday. Okay, and uh, how many times has it happened in the last two weeks, in the last month? Well, only on Saturday. Okay, so one time. And then how long did it last? So ask about frequency, ask about duration. Why do you think it's important to ask about the frequency and duration of suicidal thoughts? What do you, what do you all think? Why would I wanna know if it's happening once a week or once a day, five times a day? Why is it important to know if it's happening for just a few seconds or for an hour where the person's thinking about it over and over for an hour? <clears throat> so
Someone's got to have an idea. This is the audience participation part. Go ahead. Who unmuted your mic? Go ahead. Uh, it's Hi. Hey. <laughs> um, I just thought it'd be like a severity thing. I feel like if somebody was thinking about it all the time uh, and more often, and maybe things were escalating, you never, you never know. Excellent. Yeah, so it's a severity issue. Plus, how do I know over time if I'm treating this person's symptoms? How do I know if they're getting better if I don't know the frequency, right? So when they first come in and they say, well, I have suicidal thoughts once a day, and that usually lasts about 30 minutes. And then we, we create a plan, where I'm teaching them coping skills. And after two more visits, the person says, I say, well, how many times did you think about suicide in last week? And they say, well, twice, twice this week. Okay, so you went down from daily to twice a week. That's great, that's improvement. And how long did it last? Well, maybe a minute. That's fantastic. Not only have we decreased the frequency, but we've, we've shortened the amount of time you're thinking about it. It sounds like, I don't know, Mrs. Jones, that you've switched gears now. So when this does come up, it only lasts about a minute because you very quickly use your crisis response plan and the other coping skills that we've been working on. Am I understanding how it's working for you? And Mrs. Jones says, yes. I'm, I'm, Mastering the skills, I'm mastering the thoughts. I'm, you know, not letting them run me anymore. I'm not letting them control me. So thoughts and desires versus plans, preparation, and rehearsal. So these are sort of the behaviors uh, when we say suicidal behaviors. Then there's ambivalence and intent, and then there's access to lethal means. I this is a stylistic thing, but I like to handle access to lethal means at the very, very end of the whole conversation. I don't like to handle it here. I, I, it's an important conversation, but the sequencing on this is up to you. Remember that these five skills, we do want to do them in order, uh, starting with DI versus SI, then history of prior attempts and behaviors, but lethal means is a little bit of a different animal and you can handle that whenever you'd like. So let's look at thoughts and desires versus plans, preparation. Everything on the right, these are weighted in research studies. When we look at what puts someone at higher risk, these are weighted lower than these. In other words, the closer someone comes to physically doing it, which means rehearsing, planning, maybe writing a note, uh, then uh, those are what we call suicidal behaviors, right? And that is uh, it sort of primes the pump. It gets the person much more ready to actually do it. If you've ever studied martial arts, if you've ever uh, been into fitness, certain types of exercise, or even sports, uh, maybe even if you've played a musical instrument, you know that there's mental rehearsal that you do with all of these types of hobbies and activities. And the mental preparation that we do, that practice actually does enhance our capability to execute those actions real time. So whether we're playing a musical piece, again, whether it's martial arts, uh, and, and again, certain types of sports, that mental rehearsal does really enable us to, to uh, act on those in, in a more effective way. And that's why we believe these are so much more heavily weighted than just the thoughts and the desires. For example, if someone's thinking of, of suicidal ideation for, let's say, four hours every day or even four hours a week, Think about that. That's a long time. Can you think of the last time you thought about any one thing for four hours, even your favorite thing, right? It's really hard these days with everything going on and cell phones going off and email. It's really hard for us to really just stay focused on one thing. So that's, that's pretty remarkable. What I would also want to know if it is a long duration is how come it doesn't, how come it only lasts four hours? How come it doesn't last 10 hours? Uh, if someone says, well, it, it doesn't last longer than four because then my wife comes home and interrupts me uh, and, and you know, then we have a discussion or we, we go about our day, that is more concerning than the person says, who says, well, after four hours, I say, you know what, I, I need to stop thinking about this. And they are able to shift gears and shift their mental awareness, what they're focusing on, right? Because the latter example shows they have some sort of control over it and they're able to manage the thoughts. Whereas the, the uh, former example, the person really isn't managing the thoughts. They're really just, um, they stop thinking about it because of an environmental demand or an interpersonal demand. Now, caveat here at the bottom, this is sort of like a rudimentary scoring system. There, th this is not, this is sort of like a best 
educated guess based on the research. We do not have a scoring system or an algorithm or a decision tree that says consistently and valid and, and uh, validly that this is how at risk the person is. So, so disabuse yourself of, of the idea that we can just say, oh, two on the left and one on the right, that equals moderate risk. We can certainly guess around that, but I just want to be clear, the field does not have a valid and reliable, accurate um, rubric like that. And having said that, everything we've talked about over the last three webinars, remember, risk assessment, we can't predict future attempts. So there's no sense in us really getting wrapped around the axle about what level of risk this person is. What we should be focusing on instead is, does this person need outpatient therapy or outpatient care, maybe even med management, or does this person need inpatient care? Remember that the only time people really need inpatient care is if they need a one-on-one, -on -one, 24 7 supervision because psych hospitalization as we discussed in the first webinar there are no randomized control trials or other high quality studies showing that it reduces suicidal symptoms it most certainly reduces the opportunity to attempt but that's not really helping the person build any skills right so unless we're going to hospitalize everything else is pretty much outpatient now maybe we have access to a partial hospitalization program a day program that's fine but take your focus a little bit off of the risk assessment and instead focus more on what we do to help patients manage the symptoms, right? So how do we teach patients how to cope? That's what we want to make sure we impart. That's part of the paradigm shift uh, for really bending the suicide curve is not just focusing on risk assessment and then taking a better safe than sorry approach by hospitalizing, but rather, Acknowledging that hospitalization is is only the answer in a in a few select cases. Otherwise, the burden is on us in the outpatient community, primary care, uh, mental health clinics, behavioral health clinics, and and treating the suicidal symptoms, not just assessing them. And when we get talk about intent, this is a helpful slide because your multiple attempters. Uh, it's better to look at their objective indicators of intent rather than their subject. Remember the, as we talked about last time, your people who have attempted two or more times, they're not great at reporting how they're doing. Uh, they might be good at seeking help and raising a flag, but they're not great at sort of um, self-assessing the extent to which they're escalating, how fast they're escalating. They're not a great reporter of their symptoms. And so we try to focus on these sorts of factors versus these. Same can be said for children, okay? Children and adolescents. We always want to think about likelihood of intervention. Would someone catch them in the act? Have they planned? Have they prepared? Are they under regular supervision, right? Or are there gaps to supervision? When it comes down to actually assessing intent, we oh, here's your green screen, right? Um, but when it comes down to actually assessing intent, remember that it's if, if suicide's a state of ambivalence, it's not fair to say, do you intend to kill yourself? That's like that example we read last time where the woman said, I, I the doctor just kept asking me over and over, would you do it again? And to be honest, I couldn't tell if I would do it. All I could tell is that none of these doctors really cared about me or my feelings, right? Do you remember that? That uh, It's not really a testimonial, but it's a patient quote. The same thing here. Do you intend to die? Well, that's not really fair. If, if I'm, it's not a good question. If I'm ambivalent, that means I have reasons for living and reasons for dying. So a better question is, right now in this moment, are you willing to engage in treatment? Are you willing to try? That's a better question. Now, if someone says they're not willing to try, well, that so what you're telling me, Mr. Uh, Johnson, is you're going to leave this clinic and probably kill yourself today. If Mr. Johnson says yes, well, now we have to talk about keeping him safe, whether we bring in family members, friends, or, or send him to the hospital, right? So intent is not as simple as, yes, I'm choosing life today. Yes, I'm choosing death today. We have to think of the ambivalence. And in fact, we have to address it as such because when people are feeling suicidal, they believe all sorts of things about themselves. And 
the more they believe these, the, the more likely they are to act in these ways, right? Uncharacteristic of themselves. Um, or in ways which are more risk-taking or, or less uh, safety behaviors, fewer safety behaviors. <clears throat> so best to teach them. Would it be okay, Mr. Johnson, if I taught you a little bit about, if I shared with you a little bit about what the medical research has taught us about suicide and suicidal people? Yeah, sure, that'd be okay. Well, most people, when they uh, are thinking of killing themselves, they don't really want to die. They just don't want to live with all of the horrible things that are happening to them. Does that describe you? Mr. Johnson says, yes, that does describe me. I don't really want to die. The only thing making me want to die is how horrible life is. So if we could work on ways to improve your life, Mr. Johnson, is that something you'd be willing to do? Yeah, absolutely. So that's basically stating that he is willing to work on living. And that's what we have to ascertain within an appointment, not intent to die. That's again, that's a 50 year old framework to say SI plan intent. And we know much more about number one, how to help people, but number two, how to assess them and why we're assessing what we're assessing. So here are a few different ways to um, remember that if they don't answer the first time you ask one of these questions within these skills, don't just abandon and move on to something else, ask the same question a different way. So if he, if Mr. Johnson balked at this one, then I'll say something like, well, most people who are thinking about suicide have reasons for living and reasons for dying. They're ambivalent or they have mixed feelings. The things that are upsetting them are so overwhelming and they can't see a way to overcome it. So killing themselves seems like a solution. Does that describe you? Right. So really trying to get them to identify with the ambivalence. And we've written that a few different ways. Um, also beneficial is to take a look at their values. Right. Oftentimes values help create a context for their reasons for living. We know that the more people engage in activities daily that reflect their values, <clears throat> the less, uh, the more resilient they are. OK, and so the more easily they can handle any sorts of stressors. We don't want the patient to commit to treatment because they like us. We don't want the patient to commit to treatment because we've known them for years in the practice and they're doing us a favor. We want them to commit to treatment because it matters to them and their life matters to them because that is a more sustaining, long-term sustaining motivator for patients to stick with it, especially when it gets hard. We often hear, uh, particularly in the mental health field, behavior health field, that things get worse before they get better when someone enters therapy, psychotherapy or treatment. And there's a kernel of truth to that. And so we have to be mindful that if we hope for this person will have a sustained amount of effort over time and sustain their motivation in trying in treatment, we have to anchor the treatment in their values. We have to make sure that we are at each appointment discussing, why are we doing this? Why are you choosing to try to fix the things that are going on in your life? What do you have to live for? Okay. We talked about this. This is just a sneaky little reminder. Okay. Let's talk about access to lethal means for a few minutes. Um, one, one, one last thing about the ambivalence. Um, Skill number four, which we'll chat about today as well, is talking about reasons for living. So when you start to talk with a patient about reasons for living and reasons for dying, we know that um, people who are suicidal have a poorer ability to identify reasons for living when they are suicidal. And so one of the ways to help that happen more easily and successfully is to start with ambivalence. And of course, when we start with ambivalence, we're gonna talk about the reasons for dying. And this is true, if you are familiar with motivational interviewing, this is, that's where this research comes from. And it is the most effective way to get people to think through sort of the change process, the process of here's where I am today, but there is where I'd like to be tomorrow. And so it starts by saying, it sounds like you have several reasons to die. Some things in life that are really just making you miserable, making life intolerable. Uh, and I appreciate you sharing those with me, Mr. Johnson. They're, they're um, pretty, pretty intense. At the same time, uh, it's out, we just talked about how people who are suicidal are ambivalent. 
And so you said you would be willing to engage in treatment, but why bother? In other words, what do you have to live for? What are your reasons for living? And you get them to talk about their reasons for living. That will typically turn off the suicidal mode. So what I said earlier is if, we said this last time, if a patient's suicidal mode is turned on, our job is to get it to turn off before they leave the clinic. And that doesn't mean talking them out of it. What it means is getting them to reflect on their ambivalence and, and subsequently, right after, their reasons for living, okay? Any questions about that? It's a really important part of the process in these discussions, and it can easily be overlooked. I think it's one of the most common things that, that physicians and nurses and BHCs, psychologists, social workers, counselors overlook. All right, so <clears throat> we've talked about ambivalence. We've assessed intent in the context of ambivalence, essentially secured the patient's buy-in to keep working on this and to keep working on reducing or, or improving their reasons for dying, right? Overcoming their reasons for dying, working on the things in life. Now let's talk about access to lethal means. If someone really, really, really wants to die, let's say I really, really want to die, and the person next to me, I kind of want to die, that doesn't mean this person over here picks a firearm to use and this person over here picks a bottle of Tylenol. So it's really whatever is at the person's disposal, whatever is available tends to be what they use. When we talk to people who have survived a, when we talk about the most highly lethal attempts, we're talking about gunshots uh, or using a firearm, whether it's a shotgun or a pistol, a handgun. And what we know is that when we talk to people who have attempted suicide with a firearm and lived to tell about it, we interview them and, and said, well, how much time went by between thinking, I think I'm going to kill myself and actually picking up the gun? 24% made the decision to act within five minutes. 70% made the decision to act within one hour. What that means is that things happen quite quickly. And, and when we talk about means restriction or lethal means counseling, I would encourage you, and I'll even write this in the chat box here, avoid the word restriction. Uh, instead, what you'll say is lethal means counseling. And again, counseling just means education, just like in the medical lexicon, right? Doctors and nurses say, counsel to the patient about safe sex, counsel the patient about wound care, counsel the patient about a self-breast exam, right? So counseling within a primary care domain is all about education. So lethal means counseling. You know, you can you certainly say lethal means education. But patients have given us feedback that the word restriction makes them feel a little bit like um, kind of like the way people want to do the opposite of what an authority wants them to do. Sort of it, it, it causes some reactivity that, that we really is not, we don't need. It's not helpful for the process. So think about how effective uh, lethal means counseling is. What we're really looking to do, this is not a Second Amendment issue. We're just looking to delay access to that firearm. And in fact, when we talk to most firearm owners about this, we frame it as firearm safety. <clears throat> and the conversation goes something like this. So Mrs. Smith, it sounds like we've talked about your suicidal thoughts and we came up with this crisis response plan and you're willing to work on this. And you know, so glad that you were willing to come in today. And I'm happy for you that you're sort of in this ambivalent state, but you're really choosing to commit to uh, trying hard and continuing to, to come to treatment. Um, now, I would be irresponsible if I didn't talk to you about something called lethal means counseling. You did say you have a firearm in your house. And uh, could we talk about just firearm safety? Would that be all right? Mrs. Smith says, yes, that's fine. So Mrs. Smith, um, what kinds of things do you do to practice firearm safety? Mrs. Smith says, well, so um, I, I often, uh, while I do keep a loaded handgun in my nightstand drawer, for my other firearms, I typically keep the ammunition separate from the firearm. Oh, okay. Um, do you have a gun safe? Yes, I do, actually. I have a gun safe, and that's where all of the other uh, firearms are locked up when we're not using them. Uh, with the exception of the one I keep in my nightstand drawer. Okay, sounds good, Mrs. Smith. Are there times where you would increase the level of security of your guns? 
Yeah, I guess so. I, and so, Mrs. Smith, what are those circumstances? Well, if I'm if I'm like having company over, there are guests over, if we're throwing a party, if, for example, there are children over or people are going to be drinking alcohol, well, then I, I lock my bedroom door. Uh, that's where the gun safe is. And that's where the gun is in the nightstand. I, don't, I like to leave it in the nightstand just in case in the middle of the night there's someone who breaks into my house or an intruder. That helps me feel safe. But if I lock my bedroom door, then I'm sure no one will go in there uh, when I have company. Okay. Um, Mrs. Smith, if you had someone living in your house who was suicidal, would that be another time to maybe increase the level of safety by locking your bedroom door? Mrs. Smith says, oh, absolutely. And then I say, well, but what if that person is you, Mrs. Smith? What if you're the person who's suicidal? Is there any benefit to finding a way to increase the level of security or safety? And that's where the light bulb goes on, okay, is oftentimes they don't see this as a safety issue. They don't, they, it's almost as if people will underestimate how powerful it can be to be having the suicidal mode on and the handgun right in front of them. Um, it's almost as if they overestimate their ability to not reach for that in their deepest, darkest moment of distress. And then there are others who don't even think about it at all right? They, they just, if firearms are part of their life, it's just a part of who they are. In fact, we'll show, I think on the slides here, we have an example, people who attempted suicide via firearm, 0% returned home after the attempt and locked up the firearm, 0%. But when we do lethal means counseling, we get about 76% or 67, we'll, we'll see on the slide, it's somewhere in the 60 to 70% where they will actually then lock it up after. Uh, so again, lethal means counseling is just so helpful and decreasing access, immediate access to lethal means can be one of the most effective suicide prevention strategies. There's actually a study out of Israel where they, as you know, in Israel, um, they have to do two years of service, whether it's Peace Corps, military, some other kind of civil service to the, to the government, to the country, they were having a suicide problem among those who they had issued firearms because they were military. And so what they did was they started collecting the firearms on Fridays before going home for the weekend. They, every person put them in a locker and then on Monday they picked them up and they reduced their suicide rate by 50% just by doing that. Caitlin asked a great question in the chat box. What are your thoughts on gun locks? So typically uh, when we're doing this sort of a training in community settings with, with everyday just citizens, community members, we have this conversation. Instead of me giving the example of Mrs. Smith, we actually have it with the audience and we hear other people's ideas about what, when would you increase the safety in your house and what do you do to keep it safe so that we're generating this, this appreciation for firearm safety. And then when we ask, well, what if you are the suicidal person? We get an interesting response, but that's when we say, consider the benefits of a gun lock and we, or a trigger lock. And we use sort of motivational interviewing in that group setting to say, we have some gun locks or trigger locks on the, the, you know, at the back of the room by the door. So if you'd like one, go grab one right now or pick one up on the way out, right? Try to make it easy for them to do that. So Caitlin, you're right on target with this. And, and I would say, if you're thinking from a clinic perspective to have some, some trigger locks or gun locks available, it's a great idea. I honestly have not seen a lot of clinics do this other than the veterans, the VA hospitals that, that will do this, but it's a fantastic idea. The key is when we study uptake of those trigger locks or gun locks, we know that we get very poor uptake and poor use unless we have that eight minute conversation you and I just had. Well, the one I sort of imitated the, the pretend conversation with Mrs. Smith. Um, yeah, I, I love what you're thinking, Caitlin. If you do have some donated from the VA, it's a great opportunity to have this conversation and, and foster some more effort. Well done on that. Okay, so let's look at this. Um, when we look at uh, lethal means education, we actually get different levels of suicide risk reduction based on the type of means. So firearms are only one. Uh, there's carbon monoxide, barbiturates, pesticides. There are some European studies looking at uh, in agrarian farming communities, the use of pesticides 
um, because it's just, it's what they have on the farm. They have a ton of pesticides, right? Um, and herbicides as well. Uh, so let's look at the data. So we know that when we, uh, pa parents are patients, some of these patients were children and adolescents and some were adults. And these are the, on the right, are the percentages of people who after a suicide attempt, went ahead and sort of locked up the firearm or locked up the medication or locked up the whatever the means was that they attempted and lived. On the right, these are how many sort of went home on their own and decided to lock it up. Here's that 0% removed the firearm. On the left side here, when we did uh, means restriction uh, counseling or uh, lethal means education, this is how many percent afterwards having that conversation locked up whatever the means was. 32% dispose of medications without the discussion, 86% with did after lethal means counseling. We can even look at prescription meds versus over-the-counter meds and just look, they're, they're almost double. This one is more than double, locked it up afterwards. Those who had alcohol present, 11% restricted alcohol access just after the attempt, but when we did lethal means counseling, 47%. And here's the statistic that I find astounding. After a, a, an attempt with a firearm and someone lives through it, they didn't go home and remove the firearm, but 63% did if we had a discussion about firearm safety in the context of lethal means counseling, okay? So really powerful data here, really important to consider. And because this is such a unique conversation, this is why I like to push it to the very end of the appointment. You can do it within the context of assessing that uh, that's skill number three, assessing the current suicidal episode, but I like to push it and have it be a separate focus. Questions about lethal means counseling. Questions about skill number three, which is assessing the current suicidal episode. Okay, we've got about 20 minutes left. Skill number four, we've kind of talked about this. This is addressing the ambivalence head on. Here's your green screen. So we want to, the, the, the skill number four is talking about reasons for living, but you can't talk about reasons for living effectively without starting with ambivalence, right? So just so you know, up until now, it's been assessment, assessment, question, 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 question. Let me learn more about what this patient's experiencing. When you get to skill number four, this is where assessment pivots into intervention. You'll go from asking a question about, you feel ambivalent, you have reasons for dying. Well, what are your reasons for living? And as you start to do that, now you're transitioning in skill number four to talking about reasons for living. And that is in and of itself an intervention, okay? Really important, talking about reasons for living with a patient typically turns off the suicidal mode. And so that's why it's an intervention, all right? There's not much to talk about here because we've talked about it already today. So I'm just gonna sort of click through the green screen here, your five, six, seven different ways of asking the same question about reasons for living. Okay, now, <clears throat> because people like charts and scores and predictable sort of ways of doing this or standardized systems and processes, this is a way that, that, and again, this is not something that has been validated. This is just an educated guess. It's a working framework to help you think through things. You can hear the risk levels on the left side, whether they're a single attempter or someone who's just thinking about it versus a multiple attempter. Here's the indicated clinical response. So here's what sort of we should do. Not going to go over this in uh, extensive detail. You're welcome to look at it after we're done today. Uh, again, you'll get the slides. I actually just realized I haven't sent all the slides from the first three. I will do that, Kim, afterwards today so that you have those for all the attendees. Um, <clears throat> uh, and you'll see here uh, means restriction counseling or lethal means education, right? So we, ha we haven't really talked about protective factors, and that's because the research on protective factors shows that they don't really reduce suicide. Uh, they don't reduce suicides and they may not even reduce suicide risk. They might buffer against it. And I know that sounds like, you know, semantics, but the reality is 
there's not a lot of juice for the squeeze with protective factors. Just because someone has children doesn't mean they're less likely to kill themselves. In fact, we know from studies on mothers who, who do murder suicides where they kill their kids and then kill themselves, that the motivation for killing their children is, well, I really just want to kill myself, but I'm not going to abandon my children. So I'll take them with me to heaven or I'll take the, I'm not going to abandon them. So if it's not a religious thing, they'll say, I'll, so I, I'll kill them so that they won't have to live a life without a mother. Obviously a very sad uh, kind of sick way of thinking, but that's, that's what it is. Okay. That's what the research tells us. So the, I don't ask about protective factors. Uh, it is true that reasons for living may function as protective factors. So if you're asking about reasons for living, no need to ask about these separately. And certainly do not factor these into your risk assessment, which most of us have been taught, right, to ask about SI, plan, intent, and protective factors. Again, that's 50-year-old clinical practice. It is way out of date. It is not effective. It is, it is not sufficient. So the, the biggest benefit to asking about protective factors, should you choose to ask, is it just gives you some clues for intervention. It gives you some context for the person's life. All right. <clears throat> and here are, of course, examples. We used to think that, oh, if they have future oriented thought, then they're at lower risk for suicide. That's not true. OK, we, that, that's not something we can hang our hat on. We can rely on the, the four skills, as we've stated them, are what we can rely on. And skill number five, of course, after you've pivoted from the discussion of ambivalence, you've pivoted from assessment to intervention, you start talking about reasons for living. Once you list those reasons for living and you're, you're sort of getting the patient's buy-in to participate in treatment, then you say, well, and in true motivational interviewing fashion, so Ms. Mr., uh, Mr. Howard, if, um, so if I could give you a tool that has been shown to reduce suicides up to 76%, suicide attempts up to 76%, is that a tool you'd like me to share with you for as we embark on this, as we try to make this work? And so you then offer them a crisis response plan as the first step in, in helping them choose life, in helping them live, okay? And um, crisis response plan looks like this. Uh, once again, it has been shown to reduce suicide attempts up to 76% which does anyone know how effective, if we use our most effective depression treatment available, does anyone know what percentage of patients we can expect will um, be treated to remission? What percentage of patients with our best depression treatment? Kim says 50%. Does anyone have another guess? Best depression treatment we have. We have what percentage of patients will get better? The answer is around 60 to 65%. So if you're confident that in your clinic, you do a good job treating depression or the providers in your clinic do a good job treating depression, you should feel even more confident about your ability to manage suicidal patients because the tool in your toolbox has been shown to be more effective than our depression treatments. We're reducing suicide attempts up to 76%. <clears throat> and the key here is that it has a few different components. It starts with their warning signs. Now, where do you think we get the warning signs from? How do we know what their warning signs are other than asking them? Is there something we've talked about today, and maybe we talked about it for the last two webinars, that gives you a very clear indication of all the various warning signs that this person may think of suicide? So the answer is the suicidal mode. Suicidal mode gives you the thoughts, the feelings, the behaviors, the physiology that precede, because remember the suicidal mode turns on, we're thinking of killing ourselves or we're feeling like killing ourselves. And so uh, don't forget that you will have primed the pump by talking about the person's suicidal thoughts, how long they lasted, all of those things 
uh, when you're assessing the current suicidal episode. So the last time you're you were thinking about this, when was that, Mrs. Jones? Oh, that was that was on Saturday. Okay, how long did it last? And what were you thinking? What were you feeling? What was happening in your body? So you're asking all of those facets of the suicidal modes that when you do get to the CRP, you as the provider already have some knowledge, or you as the nurse or as the BHC, you already have some knowledge as to what we're going to be dealing with here. The second uh, step is self-management. The reason why self-management is so important is because we want to use the most um, accessible lower intensity resources first. And the reality is, I can't guarantee that, that if we just always call uh, the doctor right when the warning signs pop, I, pop up, I call a friend or I call a doctor, who knows if they're going to be there? What if it's 2 a.m. on a Saturday night? So we want to really empower people to self-manage. And so within the first time you see a patient and you're doing this, you, you'll get to this step in the in the appointment, and this is not the time to teach a new self-management skill. This is the time to rely on the other skills they've used in the past to manage the thoughts. Even if it's not working anymore, the likelihood that they have had this process exactly the way you're delivering it is pretty low. And so you can, you can bet that in the context of doing a high quality CRP like you will learn to do in the next two uh, webinars, that their self-management skills may be more effective. That if we intervene earlier at the earliest warning sign. So remember, we have the thoughts, the behaviors, the feelings, the physiology, but which one of those happens first? What's the most upstream signal of the suicidal mode turning on? If we intervene there, then the self-management skills might be more effective, right? Because we know the earlier we intervene, the more effective all of our interventions are. Also, the magic, <laughs> using air quotes, the magic behind the CRP is in the implementation. It's getting patients, they're so used to going through this sequence of thoughts and feelings that to get them to insert this and interrupt that sort of pattern that they've, they've experienced over the past, however long they've been suicidal or depressed, it's hard. And so that's where the real work is with effectively developing a CRP with a patient is helping them see how and where and when they're going to remember to either look at the CRP on their phone or pick up that index card where they wrote the CRP and, and to go through these steps. The third box is reasons for living. Now, remember, if you've talked about ambivalence and you've done skill four, you've already discussed reasons for living. So that should be on the tip of their tongue, it should be on the forefront of their mind. Um, the key is not just listing them, but list them in a way that makes the patient able to engage their reasons for living. So if it's a person, that's great. Sometimes we see this, an overlap between who the social support people are and who the reasons for living, uh, what the reasons for living activities are, and that's fine. <clears throat> but we want, if let's, someone's reasons for living, let's say is travel, we can't just hop on a plane, right? So then we have to make it focus on the next place you're gonna travel or focus on your travel dreams. So, do an internet search for flights or resorts or whatever the travel is or, or state parks or hikes, whatever that reason for living gets really good detail on it with the patient and then make it sort of actionable, not pie in the sky actionable, but actionable at any time, even at 2 a.m. How do they engage that reason for living? And finally, we have social, well, not finally, but then we have social support. And obviously those are friends and family. We want to, if you can even get them involved during the call, particularly if the person's at pretty high risk, but you're not going to hospitalize them, call these people on the spot. Say, hey, Mr. Jones, would it be okay if we called Susan? Uh, we know from the research that the more um, trusted people we get involved in your care, the higher likelihood you have for survival. So would that be okay if we called Susan and let her know that she's a part of this? And that also helps you ensure that it happens as the provider. Finally, we have crisis and professional services. One of the things that we often see is people will say, I would definitely call the, the crisis lifeline, but I would never call 911. Or like the opposite, where they say, I would never call a crisis line. I don't want to tell my problems to a stranger. But if I was really, if I were really at high risk, I would just go to the ER. Okay. So don't make them, don't write stuff down here that they're not going to do. This happens all the time with medical providers and nurses and, and, and doctors and PAs and NPs and social workers is they, they say stuff like, well, we'll just try it, or you have it here just in case. 
that's forcing your stuff on them. That's not empowering them. Empowering them is saying, which one would you actually use? And would you use even two of these? And then putting those down there. <clears throat> so as you can see, a crisis response plan when done effectively is the intervention. And earlier today, we talked about effective coping as the treatment for suicide. This is where they're getting their sort of roadmap for effective coaching. We teach them how to use this. Um, uh, we make sure that they either write it on an index card. Sometimes they take a picture of the index card of their phone. Sometimes they just write it in their phone in the notes function. So that goes back to the implementation to say what is going to make you most likely to have this on hand at any time and to pull it out at any time. Kim's asked a question in the chat box. In your experience, what's the best way to identify the suicidal mode at the earliest point with the patients? So uh, I think what you're asking, Kim, is the earliest feature of the suicidal mode, not earliest in the conversation, right? Just early, the earliest feature is once we list the warning signs, then I say, can you put them in order? Which one? routinely happens first or is there one here that's sort of an earlier sign that the suicidal mode is about to go on because patients know themselves best so we just ask them <clears throat> and notice that over time let's say i see this patient back for a second visit whether it's primary care pcbh outpatient psychotherapy if i see this patient back a second time i'm going to ask did you do it how did it go right and and can we write down even earlier reliable signs that aren't the suicidal mode, but maybe it's the trigger or maybe a feeling before your suicidal mode turns on. And we want to get this person using these active coping skills earlier and earlier and earlier so that it's upstream intervention. Likewise, if I have time in a second appointment or third appointment, I'm going to teach a self-management skill if the person doesn't have enough options, enough tools in their toolbox. Um, very important. But over time, this becomes the treatment for suicidal symptoms. Uh, and so th this is why it's so important that from appointment to appointment to say, well, how many times since the last time I saw you, it was, let's say, one week ago, how many times did you think about killing yourself? And the person says, well, twice in the last week. Okay. And how long did it last each time? Well, probably 10 minutes. Okay. And so when it happened, did you use the CRP? If they say no, we've got a lot of work to do on implementation. So is it buy-in? Do they not buy the, do not understand the benefits? Is it that they so automatically go through their thoughts and feelings and that whole cascade? Or did we just not put the right warning signs on there? Or did we not put them in the right order? So this is the real nitty gritty of helping them cope is making sure they use the CRP. Don't settle for, well, I didn't use it because I know what's on there. Yeah, but when the suicidal mode goes on and you're not thinking clearly, you want a step-by-step -step roadmap. We don't want them having to remember, right? Because memory is faulty to begin with, let alone when we are in a crisis mode. <clears throat> okay, as usual, here are the books we recommend. This is uh, BCBT, Brief Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Suicide. Uh, this is the treatment manual that teaches you how to take that CRP and then build out a treatment plan for, for effective coping. So that's emotional regulation and managing thoughts, healthy thinking. As usual, here are the resources we're sharing. We've got about five minutes left. Any questions? You guys are a bit quiet today, which is fine. Maybe it's post 4th of July. You're uh, you know, catching up on a lot of work and been out of the office, out of the clinic. Really appreciate you. Always enjoy speaking with you all and look forward to the next time. But I'll hang out if you, anyone has questions. Thank you, Dr. Corso. I know normally we're doing this on a Tuesday, but with the holiday weekend today feels like a Monday, so. Yep, it's definitely been a Monday for me. <laughs> well, if there are no questions, thanks again, and we'll see you in about a week. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful week, and we'll see you next Tuesday for Take part care. five. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.